All right, welcome back. So we're going to 42, Isaiah 42. And we'll be working our way through this chapter. My Bible here breaks it into two main sections. But uh, you could break it into more sections than that. But for sure, the, the beginning point is verses... <laughs> 1 through 9, um, and that's what we call a, a suffering servant song, suffering servant song. So the, there are four of these suffering servant songs in the book of Isaiah, and they're all uh, in these later chapters. The first is in chapter 42, the second one's in chapter 49, then there's one in chapter 50, and then the last one, which is also the most famous one, is it starts in chapter 52 and it encompasses also chapter 53. So these suffering servant songs are a big part of our future here in this uh, class. And what's so interesting about them and great about them is they give us great insight into Jesus and his own self-understanding because you ever come across these times in the ministry of Jesus or in the New Testament where they say it, it is written or thus it was written or so it will be fulfilled. A lot of the background for that, those statements are found in Isaiah in these suffering servant songs. They're characterized by a prophecy in which God speaks about his servant and foretells what he will do. Each one is a little different and they start out kind of murky, kind of uncertain about who is, who, is, who is the servant? Is the servant a person? Is the servant the nation of Israel? It's not very clear. And then as each one goes, it gets clearer and clearer until it's... By the time we get to chapter 53, it's crystal clear that we're talking about uh, Jesus. Well, Jesus wasn't alive yet. I mean, we're, once Jesus comes, it's clear that that's who it was talking about. We're talking about an individual who would suffer on behalf of the people. Um, predicting stuff right down to the crucifixion. Other places where God speaks to my servant in the book of Isaiah include, as uh, Reverend Courtright pointed out, uh, chapter 20, verse 3, Isaiah is called my servant. Eliakim is called my servant is in chapter 22, verse 20. In 37, 35, my servant David, King David, who had lived uh, a long time before Isaiah, was called the servant. And then we get into these uh, later chapters, and Israel gets called my servant a lot. Uh, in chapter 41, verse 8, we saw, you remember that? Let's go back there. Chapter 41, verse 8, but you, Israel, my servant. Right, so this is a title that's associated with Israel. And then again in verse 9, at the end of it, I said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. So this is, you know, very, very nearby. And then uh, chapter 42, verse 19, we'll get to that a little while, in a little while. You don't have to turn to it. 43, verse 10 is probably Israel. Uh, and then 44, verses 1 through 2, and verse 21 is Israel. And then 45, verse 4 is Israel. So uh, in, in these later chapters, Israel is frequently, or at least several times, called my servant. Um, so the question is, who, who is uh, 42 verses 1 through 9 talking about it? Let, let's read it first and then uh, continue our investigation. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nation. So the question here is, is this a group of people? Is this like Israel or is this a person? Is this someone who is prophesied to come in the future? And so, so uh, you know, just keep that in mind as we keep reading here. Verse 2, He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor will he make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Verse 4, He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Thus says God, Yahweh, 
who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am Yahweh. I have called you, the you here is my servant, in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. So that's what I'm talking about. The suffering servant song. Now, what's interesting here is that he doesn't suffer very much in this, uh, in this first one. Um, However, in the, in, especially in, in the last one, there's a lot of suffering that happens. So uh, we identify or we group all four of them together because of the similarities of being addressed as my servant, as being a prophecy of speaking in individual terms. You know, it says he, it says him. It doesn't say they and them, right? So it, it seems as if it's an individual. Um, but what makes it difficult is that in chapter 41, the servant was identified as Israel. And then in chapter 42, um, verse 19, it says, Who is blind but my servant? So the servant is, is blind and, and deaf and disobeying God and doing these other things. And so it's pretty clear that in the end of this chapter here as well, the servant is a reference to Israel at that, that moment in time when Isaiah was prophesying. So the servant songs do not identify who the servant is. That would just be too easy, you know. Um, so, and either God's servant is a group or an individual. Owing to the numerous identifications of Israel as God's servant, especially in Isaiah 49.3, which is even one of the suffering servant songs, many prefer this interpretation. This, this is especially uh, put forward by Jews today who are very uncomfortable with the idea of Jesus fitting Isaiah's prophecy uh, because they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah so they need to somehow make a, a, a drive a wedge between the crucifixion of Jesus and what's prophesied of him as we'll come to see in future uh, future weeks when we once we get to chapter 53 especially um, so they like to call the servant just Israel However, the servant is also described in clearly individualistic terms, right? Didn't you notice that in the beginning there? Um, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice. He will not cry or raise his voice. A bruised reed he will not break. Was this the nation of Israel? The nation of Israel will not break a bruised reed. You know, what is that talking about? Uh, so he, but, you know, people will say, well, that's a metaphor. or That's personification. A nation is being talked of as if it were a single individual. Uh, which, which happens a lot in the Bible, you know what I mean? So you can't just uh, rule it out. He is born, suffers, dies, and ultimately triumphs. Uh, this is not just in this one, but in all of them. Furthermore, the servant's mission is carried out on behalf of Israel. Check out chapter 49, verse, we'll look at verse 3 to 5. 49 is the second of these four servant songs. We're not going to go too, too in depth here. I just want to show you a couple of verses. Chapter 49, verse 3 says, He said to me, You are my servant Israel. So it's, it's, this is a, one of these servant songs. And, and Israel is clearly identified as the servant in whom I will show my glory. But I said, I have toiled in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely the justice due to me is with the Lord and my reward with my God. Verse 5. And now says Yahweh, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel might be gathered to him. So, in one breath, the servant is Israel, and in the next breath, the, ser the servant is the one who brings Israel back to God. So, if I am the person, then I don't need to bring the person back to God. I, I, I could just go back myself, right? Um, and so that's, that's pretty interesting. And then in chapter 53, uh, we'll just quickly take a look at this. You'll probably instantly recognize 
even just a couple of verses of 53 uh, because they're, they're so, um, so important later on. 53.3 says, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, and yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Um, and so you have the idea of a group, the us or the we or the our, right? And then the individual who is in the place of the group suffering on behalf of the group, okay? So that, 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 that's an example of how you have these two things distinguished. Back to the notes. It would be difficult to deny that the servant of Yahweh is described as both a people and a person. That's just a fact. If you, if you read these suffering servant songs, he's called Israel, as if it's just personification. Then other times, it seems like he's a single person who's doing this work on behalf of Israel. It, it, it says it both ways. So, what if we go with a both and theory? You know, rather than try to squeeze the, you know, either, one, uh, either one out. How do we resolve this conundrum? So this gentleman, R.T. France, summarizes this idea of corporate personality. And we have this today. I don't think we call it corporate personality because a lot of corporate people have no personality, so <laughs> I, I don't know why. Why did Bill laugh the hardest at that? I don't know. <laughs> he, knows, he knows him. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, so this is what he says, R.T. France. He says, uh, this is from the New Bible Dictionary. Funny, uh, if you ever do write a Bible dictionary, don't call it the New Bible Dictionary, because this one was from 1982. 1982 is not new anymore. Anyhow, uh, both collective and individual aspects are clearly present in the servant figure. Do you hear me? Collective and individual aspects are present. Most scholars today tend, therefore, to look for an exegesis or an explanation similar to Robinson's concept of corporate personality, which is the recognition that in the Old Testament an individual like a king or a father may represent and embody the group of which he is the head, so that he both is that group and yet can be placed over against it as its leader. It's the idea of a representative. That's what we would just call it, an agent or a representative. And so the idea is the person is the group, right? And so when the police officer knocks at the door, he doesn't say, Officer Brown, what does he say? Police, open up. Now, Officer Brown is not the police. He is a policeman. He is an officer of the police. And he is, so he's not the group. He's not the whole police force, is he? He's not even a majority of the police force. It's not even 51% of the police force, hopefully. Um, and yet he says police as if he's the group. And nobody has any problem with that. Nobody says, you're not the police, you're just one guy. Who do you think, you, what is this, a joke? Nobody says that. And if you do, you, get, <laughs> you probably get arrested right there. They have, probably have some technicality they get you on for that one. Um, and so, so we, we have this, right? They, they, uh, or like FBI, like on TV, right? They say FBI. They don't say Agent Smith, right? They say FBI. Uh, the pizza guy does this too, you know, Pizza Hut or Papa John's or, you know, he doesn't say he's, you know, some of them maybe say pizza guy, I don't know. But, you know, we have this idea in our culture, too. So the servant is Israel uh, in, in uh, 49.3. He sums up in himself all that Israel represents. I really love that. He sums up, the servant figure sums up in himself all that Israel represents. So he's the representative. He's, the, he's not just the person in charge as if taking it by taken by force or, or as if voted in to that position by a, a majority of some sort. He, he really is the people. He represents the, the best of what the people is. He sums up in himself what Israel has always been called to be. 
And yet he is an individual with a mission to Israel, and his experiences on their behalf are the object of the nation's interest. So what happens to the servant is sort of you know, counted as for all of Israel. That's the way it works with the representative, right? If something happens to that representative, it's, it's as if the whole nation experienced it. The close juxtaposition of 49.3 and 49.5, we just saw that. 49.3 called the servant Israel. 49.5 said he's going to do something on behalf of Israel to bring Israel back. Shows that these two aspects of the servant are inseparable. The individual character of the servant is most clearly expressed in 52 and 53, so that in this passage, what began as personification has become a person. And here, all the emphasis is on the vicarious nature of his suffering as a substitute for his people. But this role is only possible because he is Israel as, it rep as its representative head. The reason why Jesus can die for the sins of the people is because he's the perfect representative of the people. If he wasn't one of the people, if he wasn't uh, their representative, then it's just one person. You know, what's the big deal? You know what I mean? So he is the, the, the head. And so uh, another uh, person who, who I was reading on this said it like this. Jesus is the head. Israel is the body. So they can call my servant. So any, any, in, in, in other words, when they say my servant, it could be talking about the individual who we know from later history ends up being Jesus hundreds of years later, 700 years later. Or it could be talking about Israel. Right? And you just got to figure out which one it's talking about, recognizing and keeping uh, straight in your mind that Jesus represents Israel, so it's not really a problem. All right, let's go back to 42 and, and take it verse by verse. Now that we have a little background on who the servant is. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. The uh, first song here is not focusing so much on who the servant is, so much as what the servant will do, his function, his mission. The servant is energized by God's Spirit. Did you notice that? He says, I have put my spirit upon him. Check back in uh, uh, chapter 11. Keep your finger here. Chapter 11, if you recall, is this magnificent prophecy of the Messiah, the one who is to come a descendant of the King David. So we're talking about the royal figure. You know, a lot of pe up until the time of Jesus, a lot of people thought there were going to be two or three different saviors that would come. They thought one would be the suffering servant, thought another one would be the conquering king, and a third would be a priestly figure. You know what I mean? And, and, and it's not at all clear at the time of Jesus that it's all one person. So this, this is something we have, in hindsight, looking back, because we have this idea of Jesus coming twice. He comes the first time to suffer. He comes the second time to conquer. And in the meanwhile, he's working as a priest, as a mediator. You know what I mean? So it, it all makes sense to us. But in Isaiah's time, you know, these, these are, these are uh, enigmas and, and uh, you know, prophecies where, where some parts might be clear, but... Putting it all together is not until, the, until Jesus does what he does. And that's really uh, what's so remarkable about Jesus. But chapter 11, verse 1, you have this conquering king uh, idea. Uh, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. A branch from his roots will bear fruit. That's the idea. Jesse is the father of the great king David. Uh, verse 2, the spirit of the Lord. This is the very first thing it says about this Messiah who's coming. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. That's the first thing. The spirit of God is going to rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make decisions by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor. So the idea is that this person is energized by God's spirit so that he is able to make right decisions without bending justice, taking bribes, twisting things so that the uh, disenfranchised get taken advantage of. 
He's going to decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his slip, lips he will slay the wicked. That's why I say conquering king. This is not a bruised reed who's not going to, you know, to, to uh, you know, even knock the end of a wick off after it's been burned on a candle. I mean, we're talking about somebody who's going to knock more than wicks off candles here. With the breath of his lips, he's going to slay the wicked, it says. You know what I mean? So you can see why they wouldn't think the Messiah and the suffering servant will be the same person. Right? How, how are you going to not lift up your voice and then with your voice slay the wicked? You know? So, but knowing that it's two comings of Christ, that he came the first time and then he's going to return as a conquering king helps. But in both, the Spirit of the Lord is the key uh, attribute that is first put as um, put upon him. All right, back to 42. Isaiah 11 is just so wonderful that we could just probably <laughs> do that whole chapter again, but uh, I just wanted to bring your attention to that. I've put my spirit upon him uh, concept there. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Do we need justice in the nations today? Sometimes I, I, I just I marvel. I, I'm just amazed that humankind has been around this long, and, and we still can't figure out how to get along with each other. You know, we feel like we're so sophisticated. You know, we have uh, the ability to, you know, webcast this, this very moment across anywhere in the world and into outer space, you know. And yet, people are still killing people. People are still robbing people. You know, uh, Sudan recently split in half. Did you know that? South Sudan is the youngest country in the world. Because they, they couldn't get along. So they, you know, Sudan's not like a big place already. It was on your map. It was right uh, below Egypt there. You know, and, and they just split in half. You know, there's, it's unbelievable. Even, even in America where, where um, generally if you call the police, they come, you know, which is, we take that for granted. It's not like that in most of the world. You call the police and they actually come. And the police are not always the... Uh, the, on the same team as the mafia, right? In other countries, generally, the police are always on the same... They are the mafia, or they are the, the criminals, are the police. You know what I mean? In America, you know, you, usually the police are not on the same team as the criminals, so that's helpful. I mean, sometimes they are, unfortunately. You know, and yet still in America, justice, injustice overflows the land, doesn't it? In all, in all kinds of uh, different areas of our life. So the first thing it mentions is uh, 42.1, my servant whom I am uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. Uh, I have put my spirit upon him. What's the first thing it says he was going to do? He's going to bring forth justice to the nations. And that's interesting too because in the Old Testament, especially you know, in Isaiah, God's only working with one nation. You know, or, or maybe two if you want to count Israel and Judah. And yet, here the scope is not Israel. Here the scope is not Judah. It's the nations. It's, it's the world. It's a global, uh, a global problem with a global solution. Uh, this, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, you know, that, that sounds just like this um, uh, baptism, when Jesus was baptized. Uh, can we check that out real, uh, really quickly? Mark uh, 111. Let's just be quick. Uh, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth, and he was baptized by John. He shoots out of the water the Holy Spirit like a dove, right? So you have the Spirit like a dove coming upon him, right? And then what's, what, is, what does God say in verse 11? And a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I mean, it's not exact, because it says, My servant, in whom I am well pleased here. But it's, it's pretty close. Um, and so you have the Spirit and, and, and so on. Also, Jesus is called my servant, or, or sorry, servant in Acts 3.13, verse 26, chapter 4, verse 27, and verse 30. So Jesus is called servant um, even after he's raised from the dead. He's still called the servant of God, you know, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, but that's, that's a pretty normal way to refer to Jesus, that he is the servant of God, and he fills his role. All right, verse 2. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. 
Um, verse 3, a bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. That's like that little bit on the end of the candle I was talking about. What does it say? A dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. I mean, we're talking about somebody that is ultra gentle, ultra meek, and not uh, abrupt and coarse. and You know, the opposite of a bull in a china closet is being described here. He will faithfully bring forth justice. All right, so this section here is quoted in the New Testament, in Matthew. So let's go there. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12 is a part of Jesus' ministry where he had just healed the man with the withered hand. And... You know, it's, it's, it's talking about his healing ministry. And right after this quote, he talks about casting out a demon from someone. So we're talking about a chapter that is focused on his healing ministry, his deliverance ministry, if you want to call it that. Um, chapter 12, verse 13 says, Then he said, this is the guy with the withered hand, Stretch out your hand. Remember this, anybody? Okay. He stretched it out, and it was restored to Rome like the others. And what was the Pharisees' response? They went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. But Jesus, aware of this, did not lift up his voice in the street and yell at them. But what did he do? He withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and warned them not to tell who he was. Verse 17. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold... My servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Now nation is Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out, until he leads justice to victory. You notice that until there? So that, that allows for the possibility that he could have one mode of operating until that was fulfilled, that justice was fulfilled, and then you better watch out because, you know, he comes on the white horse with the sword coming out of his mouth, slaying the wicked. You know what I mean? I mean, he's not a, uh, a teddy bear in the book of Revelation, is he? Um, a battered reed he will not break off until he leads justice to victory, and in his names the Gentiles will hope. And here we are. The Gentiles hoping in Jesus. Right? Um, then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him. So that the mute man spoke and saw, and all the crowds were amazed. Who is this guy? Is he the son of David? You know? Back to Isaiah. So th this is... This suffering servant song, which is just verses 1 through 9, is specifically pointed to by Matthew as a reference to Jesus. So we're not guessing about this. This is not speculation here. Um, it's, it's clearly identified, and uh, specifically in reference to his uh, ministry, in the context of his healing ministry, and that he was not... Um, trying to tell, trying to like make a big popular movement. He, he would say, don't tell people who I am and, and things like that is, is how it was uh, used there. So verse 4, he will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands, the ends of the land, will wait expectantly for his law. Justice is the idea of setting things right. Now, Jesus did this in his ministry. He did it in his death. And he will bring about complete justice when he returns. Right? Think about things that he set right in his ministry. C can you think of any examples of what he, what he did in his ministry on earth? Right, so like some people that were healed... Any other examples you can think of? The woman with the issue of blood? Sure. Um, right, because if you run out of wine at a wedding, that's an injustice. You know, there's something wrong with that. 
and he fixed that injustice. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking also of like the, the woman that was the town center, and she came in. You remember that? And she washed his feet and, and so on. And, you know, he said, your, your sins are forgiven. You know, it's like he said it right. Or the leper. Uh, if you're a leper or even a tax collector. You know, he, 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 he worked with people that were on the fringes of society, that were outcasts from society, and he brought them back in. You know what I mean? Like the leper, nobody would touch a leper. Nobody would talk to a leper. Nobody would want anything to do with a leper. Maybe you'd give him some food to do a good deed, but that's it. Jesus embraced the leper. He healed the leper, and now the leper is able to come back into the community. What does he say to the, the lepers when he heals them? Go show yourself to the priest. That was protocol to be accepted back into the the community, to be restored back to um, a meaningful life after that, after living in the caves and homeless and whatnot. Um, and so Jesus did, that was his, a lot of what his ministry was about was setting things right. You know, the time he encountered the uh, widow woman whose only son had just died, right? Remember that in the city of Nain and, you know, Jesus and his people are coming and then the funeral procession is coming out and they kind of awkwardly meet right outside the gate of the city. And Jesus tells the mother to stop crying. You know, one thing you're never supposed to say to somebody at a funeral, stop crying. What? <laughs> Who are you? Unless you're going to raise the guy from the dead, in which case you're qualified to say stop crying, right? Because you really mean it. And so he raised her from the dead. So like he would encounter things that were broken and he would set them right. That's what his ministry, a lot of his ministry was involved in doing. Uh, his death was the ultimate setting of wrongs right. It was the payment for sin. He died for our sins. And that, and that payment works you know, backwards and forwards in time. You know, it was like uh, some sort of large meteor hitting the earth, right, where it has shock waves that go in all directions. Right? His, his death on that cross you know, had this incredible impact in time in both ways, and it set things right. We talk about justification. Isn't that what we talk about? Justification by faith, through grace, and so on. Um, and so in his death, he did justice. And then, of course, when he returns, what's Jesus going to do? He's going to destroy the wicked. He's going to have judgment with the wicked and bring the, the uh, righteous back to life so that they can live because it's not because that's fair. That's what's right. So Jesus is, is definitely you know, qualified as, as is my servant. Until he has established justice in the earth. He's going to establish justice in the earth. He already has a lot, and he has in our own lives. You know, I was thinking of justification. These notes here are what we call full justified. Anybody know what that means? Even on both sides, right? And uh, so before that, they were just left justified. I don't know how you sent them. I didn't. Right. You sent them left justified, right? I sent mine left justified too, which means they're lined up on the left side. And the right side's a little jagged, you know. And uh, Grace justified the right side too. So now it's just double justification here. And so the idea is you're, you're, you're out of whack. There's something that's not lined up, and you fix it. You set it right. In this case, set it left and set it right at the same time. So that's, that's what Jesus is in the business of doing in our own lives and also in the age to come. Verse 5, thus says God. Now God sort of jumps into the scene here, right? Who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth, and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. God's like a boxer. And in the red shorts, we have the one who created the heavens and stretched them out. You know, this is his intro, right? He's not satisfied to say, thus says God, Yahweh, da 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 It's like, thus says God, Yahweh, who created the heavens and stretched them out, weighing, you know, however many pounds, you know, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people. I'm the one that give you people breath is what God says to us. And the spirit to those who walk in it. Good parallelism here, right? Breath and spirit, the same meaning. I am Yahweh. This is what God says. I have called you, this is my servant, you, in righteousness, I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will point you as a covenant to the people, as a light 
to the nations. Does anybody know the Latin word for covenant? Anybody? Testamentum. That's, where, that's why we have New Testament and Old Testament. It's because for about a thousand years there, Christians were big into Latin. Right? And so if that wasn't the case, we would call it covenant. It would call Old Covenant and New Covenant, but that was the name it already had, so we just stuck, stuck with it. Novum Testamentum is what the New Testament is in Latin. And so Jesus, or, the, or my servant here, says, I will appoint you as a testament to the people, or as a covenant to the people, a new way of relating to God. Uh, back in your notes here. The servant is set as a covenant for the nations. This cannot refer to the Old Covenant the law of Moses, because it was made only with Israel and her descendants. It was an ethnic covenant. The new covenant, in contrast, includes all people, whether Jew or Gentile. What did it say here? It said, I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, not just to Israel. In Simeon's prophecy, he quoted Isaiah 42.6. This is really cool. We've got, we got to look at this one. and Then we'll have to rush through the rest of the chapter. But it's worth it. It's worth it. You have to make these decisions, you know, when, you, when you're working through these things. But Luke chapter 2, we have Simeon. You remember the baby Jesus, right? His parents uh, brought him to the temple, you know, dedicated him, did, did all the proper sacrifices, circumcised on the eighth day, you know, uh, offered the turtle doves. Luke chapter 2, verse 25 And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So Simeon's got it it going on here. Verse 26, And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah, the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the spirits brought in the child Jesus to carry out for for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said... So this is the declaration, the blessing, the prophecy of Simeon here. Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. That's a quote from what we just read, Isaiah 42, 6. So this idea that there would be one who would come, who would be a light, not just to Israel, but a light also to the Gentiles, but from Israel. It was an Israelite who's a light to the Gentiles. That was definitely in his mind. And the glory of your people Israel. And, of course, Jesus' parents were like, who is this guy? <laughs> right? They were amazed at what he said. Back to Isaiah 42. I should have put something there to mark my spot. You guys beat me. All right, verse 7, to open blind eyes. This is all part of this servant's occupation or function or mission. To open blind eyes. Did Jesus open blind eyes? That was like, on his resume, like, number one or number two, right? Opens blind eyes, heals withered hands, touches lepers, you know, cleanses lepers. I mean, he opened quite a few blind eyes, right? To bring out prisoners from the dungeon. I, I, don't, I don't believe Jesus ever actually did any prison breaks, but um, he, he certainly did bring people out of the, the prisons that they were in spiritually, right? There's a lot of demonic imp- oppression that he, bro- he broke people out of and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. This also reminds me of Jesus' opening uh, teaching in uh, uh, Luke chapter 4, where it talks about how he uh, thought about his own mission. We'll get to that probably when we do chapter 61. Um, Jesus is still in the uh, blind opening business today, right? I have the words here for amazing grace. Uh, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. So Jesus was, was opening people's eyes back then, and he's still opening people's eyes. And again, when he comes, there, that's part of the resurrection, is that there won't be any blind people there. Everyone will be healed of any kind of blindness. 
Um, verses uh, 8 and 9, I am the Lord, that is my name. I am Yahweh, that is my name. You can't read Lord there, can you? I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. This is the idea of having absolute confidence that God is backing this promise up. I mean, they had to wait hundreds of years. They had to wait centuries for this to come. But God said, look, you know, I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. The former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Like, look, this other stuff's happened. I'm declaring new things. This new stuff's going to happen too. Um, and then we get this really nice part in verse 10 to uh, 13 where uh, things are kind of positive and uplifting. It reminds me of chapter 12 of Isaiah, after you read chapter 11 of Isaiah. Remember, 11 was the one that talks about the Messiah, how he's going to bring justice. It has the wolf dwelling with the lamb. No one's going to hurt in, in, in any of the area anymore. There's going to be peace. And then chapter 12 is just like this huge uh, declaration of praise in light of what the promise was. Here we have something similar. Verse 10, Sing to Yahweh a new song. Sing His praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and those who dwell on them, let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices. Uh, wilderness is like desert, uh, typically in the Bible. Uh, the settlements where Kedar inhabits, those are uh, nomadic tribes that lived out in the desert. And the inhabitants of Selah sing aloud. I, I read somewhere that that's Petra, the uh, ancient city of Petra. was a desert city carved out, out of the side of a rock. Um, it's pretty cool. You can, you can find it online and look at it if you want. Um, but even the, the people living out of the side of a rock, you know, even the people that are nomadic and nobody even today knows where they are. Google has a hard time keeping track of them on their satellite pictures. You know, uh, the, even these obscure people at the ends of the earth, so to speak, lift up your voices, let them shout for joy, from the tops of the mountains. So we've done the sea, we've done the islands, we've done the desert, we've done the mountains. Everybody jump in on this. Let them give glory to Yahweh and declare His praise in the coastlands. Yahweh will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse His zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, He will raise a war cry. He will prevail against His enemies. Isn't that a beautiful song? So the... the 42, 1 through 9 is what we're calling the suffering servant song, the first suffering servant song. And then we get this other song of praise afterwards. So there's a lot of music going on here. You guys ready for the uh, depressing part? I didn't leave too much time for it. So. But I, 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 will, I will say this. 43 starts on an up note. It's too bad we're not doing 43 tonight. All right, 14. I have kept silent for a long time. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now like a woman in labor, I will groan. Whoa. I will both gasp and pant. Lamas, right? I will lay waste the mountains and hills and wither all their vegetation. I will make the rivers into coastlands and dry up the ponds. I will lead the blind by a way they do not know. In paths they do not know, I will guide them. I will make darkness into light before them and rugged plain places into plains. These are the things I will do, and I will not leave them undone. They will be turned back and be utterly put to shame who trust in idols, who say to molten images, you are our gods. You have two things intertwined here. First of all, you have this sense that God's holding back, and he's holding back for a long time. And then at a certain point, he says, Ugh! you know, and he just goes at it, right? That's like this woman, you know, who's not holding it in anymore. You know, you get to a certain point where, if there's no epidural, you start screaming, right? And it's like, it's it's, there's, there's no holding it in anymore. And, and, you know, he's like laying waste the mountains and the hills and, and all this other stuff. And, but he's, he's also taking care of the blind, right? The blind, you notice that there's no negative things said about them. He's leading them. He's taking care of them. He's bringing them where they need to go, right? But then those who are doing the idols, who are trusting in idols... Uh, it's not so good for them. Utterly put to shame, right? And so this is the idea that when, when God acts, it's not just in judgment, but it's also in restoration, that he, that he 
you know, he brings judgment on the wicked, but he also restores the righteous. He rewards his, his people who stay true to him. Verse 18, so now here's the practical application to the audience who reads this in Isaiah's time and in our time. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Here's the application point. Or so deaf is my messenger whom I send, who is so blind as he that is at peace with me, or so blind as the servant of Yahweh. You have seen many things, but you do not observe them. Your ears are open, but none hears. Yahweh was pleased for his righteousness' sake to make the law great and glorious. But this is a people plundered and despoiled. All of them are trapped in caves or are hidden away in prisons. They have become a prey with none to deliver them and a spoil with none to say, Give them back! Who among you will give ear to this? Who will give heed and listen hereafter? <laughs> That's us, right? <laughs> Who's going to listen after, hereafter, right? Who's going to listen? Who gave Jacob up for spoil and Israel to plunderers? Was it not Yahweh against whom we have sinned, in whose ways they were not willing to walk, in whose law they did not obey? So he poured out on him the heat of his anger and the fierceness of battle, and it set him aflame all around. Yet he did not recognize it, and it burned him, but he paid no attention. This is where the tone shifts in his, in his confrontation. This is Isaiah confronting the people, and he's saying, look, you guys are deaf. You're blind. Are you going to hear what I'm saying? Are you, are you going to um, see what I'm trying to show you? Um, even though his people suffered his wrath, they still did not even realize it or take it to heart. It's the end there. Uh, so he poured out upon them the heat of his anger. Now, I mean, I... I as, as, as Reverend Corder, I mentioned, it's difficult to do all the timing on here because it seems like this is a future history thing. You know, it kind of matches with once they're taken out of Babylon and the rest. But regardless of all that, take it from our perspective today. From our perspective today, we know that Israel did not listen to Isaiah, or Judah did not listen to I Isaiah. He listened in Hezekiah's time, but the next king was Manasseh, right? And they did not listen to Jeremiah, the least successful prophet in all the Bible. I mean, nobody listened to Jeremiah except for like his scribe, right? You know, uh, which is why his book is so depressing. But uh, so glorious too because you see such strength there, you know. But we, we, know the, we know the after story, don't we? We know that the people of God did not listen to their prophets and that they were carried away from their land. They were brought to Babylon for 70 years. And then did God stayed true to his promises and brought them back. We know that. And what we do is when we look back on it, we say, God poured out the heat of his wrath on his people. And they did not recognize it. Even when it happened, they did not recognize it. And it burned him, but he paid no attention. Even though they were burned by the heat of God's wrath, they're like, huh, what's that? <laughs> we would be fooling ourselves to think we are immune to the same hard-heartedness. You know, we don't look at this and say, oh, those, those crazy Israelites, those stupid Judeans. No, we say, where am I blind? Where am I deaf? Where's my, hard, uh, where's my heart so hardened as to not even sense God in this situation that I'm in right now? You know what I mean? Uh, it reminds me of, uh, I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where it says, these things are written for our examples. And what is he referring to there? He's talking about the desert wanderings where they tested God over and over and over again. And they saw his miracles and his wonders and they kept testing him. And he says that was written for our examples so that we wouldn't do the same thing. Hebrews makes the same point about the desert wanderings. So, you know, I, I think we need to, we must constantly go to God and ask him to help us to see correctly. Father in heaven, we ask you that you would help us, that you would reveal to us, that you would help us to understand where, um, where we're blind, where we're deaf, where are the areas that um, we're not wholly devoted to you, and, and, and please reveal those to us and help us to break through. 
and draw closer to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.